So welcome to our daily conference update from the Climate Change and Consciousness Conference in Fintorn, where we talk about the emerging themes and the most important themes where we talk about this week. And as always, we start with the highlights of my guest, uh, Vandana, welcome. You are uh, a scholar and an environmental activist and an advocate in, uh, from India. Uh, what was your highlight of the day? Uh, my highlight of the day was the opening with Leslie's clown performance because she just distilled the key issues. Can you in, say what the key issues, like what was so funny? Well, you? first, of course, she came in and said, we are Shakti. And that is what I was trying to say, that we are power. Why do we constantly hand over power? Mm. Or how? why do we externalize power to a consumer item when we are generators of energy mm. and should be? Um, As you brought it in a funny way. Of course. I mean, in the way she combined the the core messages with the most amazing laughter. I haven't laughed so much for very, very long. And then for me, it was very special to, to be there with Jonathan because in 1985, we jointly launched the World Rainforest Movement to yeah. protect the tropical rainforest. And... Um, And it's so good to see fellow warriors go strong after all these decades. Nice. Thank you. Uh, Charles Eisenstein, you're from the United States, and you plead this in your talk this week for uh, seeing the world in a new way as a living world. Uh, we'll talk more about that later, but uh, what was your highlight of the day? Well, it's not a very new way, uh, but we can talk about that later. Yeah, my, my highlight today, I had a very mellow day, and I went out to the ocean, which is just 10 minutes walk from here and listen to the waves. Yeah, it was beautiful. Mm -hmm. Nice. Yeah, except for the fighter jets that were circling. Yeah, so we have those days. Although yeah. I had that in the past. It, they, 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 the people in Finland use it as a kind of a mindfulness moment. Mm -hmm. When the fight yet came over, you couldn't speak literally. So mm -hmm. it's mild today. But thanks for sharing your highlight. Uh, Spring Cheng, you uh, were born in China moved to the United States in your 20s and studied uh, science. Uh, and then later on, you went back to China again to uh, study acupuncture and ancient Chinese uh, medicine. So welcome. What was your uh, highlight of the day? Mm. Well, actually, I studied uh, acupuncture in Seattle. Ah, but okay. that's another story. Um, my highlight of the day is I um, run an open space session mm -hmm. uh, where I taught uh, a few people a theater game. And some people who have never... Um, dance theater before came and I was just really um, heartwarmed to share this form of art I love mm. to them and uh, spark their interest and we had a really lovely connecting time and had lots of fun. Beautiful, yeah. thanks. Banana, you talked about it's about soil, not about oil. Can you explain what you mean with that? Well, it's not about oil because 200 years we've drilled deep for fossilized living matter mm. which is what fossil fuels are they were once plants and living material they were living carbon now they're dead carbon and this dead carbon being extracted 600 million of years of work has just spread in these 200 years death all around whether it's death through destabilizing the earth's self-organizing climate systems, or it's death through the chemicals and toxics that were derived from these fossil fuels and are killing life everywhere, including the disappearance of 80% of the spe insect species. 95% of the plants that we grew to eat, we used to eat 10,000 plant species, and now we grow and trade in four, mm. most of which goes to animal feed and biofuel. But most importantly, oil made us forget soil. It made us forget we are soil. That living soil is humus. The word human is derived from humus. And an ancient Veda in India says that in this handful of soil is your future. Take care of it, it'll take care of you. And the history of every civilization that has gone is a history of people who stopped caring for the soil. Fossil fuels made us forget our duty to the living earth, the duty to the living soil, that we have to give back to the earth mm. to keep the soil living. And that's what agroecology, regenerative agriculture, organic farming is. It is not anymore a choice. It's an imperative 
also because industrial farming gives 50% of the greenhouse gases and 100% of the solution would be care for the earth, would be regenerating the biodiversity of the forests and the farms and would be creating good food. We wouldn't just be taking care of the health of the planet, we'd be taking care of our health. Mm. Because the story in the, in the news is always like CO2, CO2, greenhouse gases, but you have like a kind of different perspective. Soil is for my, like, well, it's for me like, oh, it's like something different. Yeah, and soil is, of course, humus, a large part of it is living carbon, but it is every element mm. in the periodic table. And it is trillions of living organisms. That's why we can't be reductionist. First, we were reductionist by putting everything of our thinking into fossil fuels. Now we are being reductionist again and thinking of carbon reductionism. And the language of zero carbon, decarbonization are very wrong from the perspective of a living earth system mm. where living soil includes living carbon, which is humus. So living soil is also for you like like a, about biodiversity and about... It's biodiversity all. of the soil. I mean, the biodiversity of the soil, mm -hmm. soils that are organic are so rich in biodiversity, it's a soil food web out there. But that richness is also mimicked in our gut. Mm -hmm. We have a garden and a rainforest in our garden, a hundred trillion organisms. And this continuum of biodiversity is the secret to health. Right. Charles, uh, what do you think about this plea? Well, I, f I feel like Vandana is about 10 steps ahead of, of climate science, which is fortunately, thankfully, starting to validate the importance of soil, uh, but from the carbon lens. So... Yes, we must regenerate soil because the sequesters, it can store and sequester X amount of CO2. And, and maybe that's a positive step, but to see it simply as valuable in terms of some reductive component really misses the picture. Uh, you, don't, you don't see its importance in maintaining the water cycle, for example, which is actually much more important to a stable climate than mere temperature is. And then, you, as, as Von Lennon was saying, you don't see it as, as a living being. Um, one handful of soil has as many living organisms as there are humans on this, as, as humans have ever lived on this planet. Mm. So, so it's seeing as the, the, the earth as one instead of like only... Seeing the soil as an organ of the earth, yeah. you know, that, that is essential to, even if you could somehow sequester carbon with machines or cool the earth with sulfur aerosols in the atmosphere. If the soil dies, the planet dies. Mm -hmm. Spring, how, how, do you look, how do you listen to this conversation? Um, I, uh, I find that there's so much resonance and coherence in both, both what Vadana and Charles saying, how to think about the climate, the complexity and unpredictability of uh, climate change from a, a system view that is so much resonant with the Taoism, the ancient Taoist ideas and the paradigm. Mm. Um, so, um, in the um, um, so for example, in the in the Taoist view, we see that the human body is actually an embodied model of the ecosystem around us. So the all the elements like a soil, carbon, water. And energy is actually, for in the Taoist language, is a metaphor of uh, some part of ourself, both the physical body and also the psychic realm. Mm. Thank you. I think we'll, we'll talk about that later. Mm -hmm. uh, let's go, Charles, to you because you plead this uh, in your talk. You said like, let's see the, the the world as a living world, and you said like it's actually not a new vision; it's very old. Uh, can you say what you mean with? Uh, oh yeah, I mean for every traditional culture, indigenous culture, hunter-gatherer, peasant culture, they knew that the world is full of being mm -hmm. and that everything is a being and they related to the world as such. So in, in that uh, view, you can ask questions like, what does the land want? What does the water want? And you see yourself as a participant in something, a larger life and a larger consciousness. These are questions that it, that it does not occur to the modern mind to ask these questions. Therefore, the modern mind is incapable of seeing the intricacies and the interdependencies. 
so yeah it's it's not it's not this new idea that earth is alive that was you know invented by james lovelock in 1974 or something like that it's a return to a primal understanding and a primal relationship but how is it possible that we lost that because i came in this time of the world and for me I see it over the last few years, that of the last year that I lived in the winter, that it's changing for me. That mm -hmm. I start seeing, like, oh, I'm actually part of nature. Like, how do how do we lo lo lose? Well, we that? have a whole society that embodies the belief that nature is a thing. So we are surrounded by standardized, generic commodities that have been stripped of their relatedness and their uniqueness. That's what makes something into a commodity. So if you're surrounded by standardized objects, and you're not in daily reciprocal relationships with the beings even the humans around you like are you in any kind of relationship with your neighbor besides that you know their name maybe do you depend on each other do you need each other mm. so so it, yeah so we're in a society that and also an ideology of reductionistic materialism which is becoming obsolete but we're in an ideology and a society and an economy that whispers in our ear every day, you live in a world of things. You live in a dead world, a world without intelligence. Hmm. Therefore, the betterment of the human condition comes through imposing intelligence onto that which has none. Totally understandable to think that way in the circumstances that we're in. But not helpful for the benefit of the earth. Yeah, ultimately, it's an inaccurate viewpoint. Hmm. Um, and how can I, like, how would it change my life or your life, like, when I start living in that way, when I re, re, regain that, 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 that view of the world? It would change your life in every way. It, in the same way that if you are in a relationship where you've been objectifying your, the other person, and now something happens and you see them as a real person now, everything changes. But would you say it's also like I would see a car or any object as a living thing? That's like yeah, even a car or a brick. You would ask, what is the fulfillment of the destiny of this car, and what am I meant to do in relationship to this car? So for a car, maybe it is to drive the car. For a brick, maybe it is to build something. But when you start asking that question of a, a patch of soil or a river, then it leads you to places that you cannot imagine at the beginning hmm. and did you had a, a shift yourself like you came from the other did you discover this or did you always have this in you everybody has always had it in them hmm. there's a, a silent protest within everybody who was born into the religion of scientific materialism that okay but a lot of people also discover like a new they had like a kind of a, 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 a moment of transformation or that they discovered like oh i actually always had this in me did you mm -hmm. have something like this or I can't say that I had one experience that I can um, credit with that. Hmm. But uh, where I'm searching for is like, can you see the change, like that you that you act out in a different way now? You see the world in this perspective. Well, I was always a half-hearted participant in the story of normal. Hmm. It wasn't looking so good by the time you know I'm a little. Well, you know, actually, I'm already fifty, but um, you know, in my parents' generation, it was looking pretty good. The program of conquest, of rising above nature, of domination. It looked like we were gonna, we were gonna win. We were gonna conquer all disease, and we were gonna have robots doing all the work. And this promise of technological utopia, by the time I came of age, was already starting to wear thin. Hmm. So um, maybe I'm just channeling a collective shift in consciousness. Hmm. Hmm. Banana, how do you? look at the world, seeing the world as a living being? Yeah. Well, first of all, I'm from a civilization that has always seen the world as living, that this universe is living and it's sacred, that we are one species among many, that this earth is for the benefit of all. It is living. Every part of it is living. Every part of every being is living. Mm. And that deep consciousness has shaped our Ayurveda, our systems of healing, our knowledge, our relationships with each other. But I also did my PhD in quantum theory, which already told us the world is not made of things. Mm. The world is made of potential. 
And from the last 50 years, I've participated in movements where ordinary peasants and ordinary tribals recognize that the earth is living, that they are part of this very living system and therefore have duties and responsibilities. And from that flow the rights. Um, I think the break is a constructed break with the fossil fuel age, which declared nature as dead mm -hmm. in a very, very systematic way. The entire scientific system was rewritten. And that's why Bacon wrote the birth of masculine time was this objectification of the earth and the conquest paradigm. And it's been built in that way. Or Newton saying these immutable particles were made by God and they can't be changed. In life and living beings just disappeared. I've always been, even in my physics training, very, very at odds with this mechanical way of thinking mm. and this dead way of thinking. And because I've participated so long in so many ecology movements at the grassroots, I can tell you the perspective of a living earth is, is really the dominant perspective if you don't see the dominant West as all of the universe. Mm -hmm. And you recognize not only that so many cultures think differently, have thought differently, even in cultures where it looks like China, that it's all about being the factory of the world, Taoism is rising and is shaping a whole new phase of transformation. And within the West, there's the kind of shift that Charles is talking about. Mm. We, do, we run the Earth University at the Navdanya farm in Dehradun in, um, in the Himalaya in India. And increasingly, we get young people who earlier used to come to learn organic farming and seed saving. Now they come how to experience a living Earth and find their own life, their own meaning, their own direction. And what do you see changing in them, like on a practical level, like how they live now and how they live? Three things. Different? First, they rediscover their hands. Yeah. Fossil fuels chopped our hands off and said, oh, we got to get rid of drudgery, got to get rid of human beings, got to get rid of work. All efficiency of the fossil fuel age mm -hmm. is getting rid of the creativity of our hands. And in the process, getting rid of our creativity, our intelligence and the intelligence of the earth. The second thing is because we are a community, just like Findhorn is, and we live in the context of being part of an earth community, rediscovering the potential of being community and not an isolated, lonely, floating and atom, which is what Western consumerism has given us with Margaret Thatcher saying, there is no society, there are only atoms. We have to rediscover mm. the community. And third is the joys of simplicity. A good meal. Suddenly people realize eating well can be so satisfying. It is not just a sacred act, it becomes a joyful act. And you don't have to keep running and paying fancy amounts of money for bad food in a restaurant. So that's also like how you can maybe discover this living earth, like doing simple things, enjoy food. Exactly, and, uh, exactly. Start doing things with your hands. Doing things with our hands to regenerate the earth. Yeah. Because yeah. the earth will not be regenerated by a WhatsApp program. She needs the meeting of this earth and the earth outside. And when the two become one in love and for us, a gratitude. For me, good farming is nothing but an act of gratitude. You say thank you to the earth and then she gives us what we need. Rather than the forcing through chemicals and fossil fuels and violent instruments, every bit of the nourishment she gives and turns it into nutritionally empty commodities that are spreading disease. 75% of the diseases of the world are because of bad food, mm. which then goes back to the fossil fuel age, yeah. when the earth gives us nourishment. Thank you. Uh, Spring, mm -hmm. how do you listen to the living world? Um, well, like what Vadana said, to me it's like, um, yeah, what else? <laughs> <laughs> what else? Yeah, yeah cuz it's been something in, like uh, ingrained in us for so long. Yeah. Like even when I was little, I received a Western education and the materialism. I see that as a story. I mean, there's always part of me never believed it because I I can feel the mountain, I can feel the river and uh, 
I, I think I just compartmentalized the part of me to do the science uh, where the rest of me was having a different experience with the nature. I mean, that's a bit of, it, it's actually created some conflict within myself too, but that's a different story. Um, what I want to say is that, uh, one thing I want to say is that I, I think the story, it's not, I, I don't feel like our modern society lost it, that, you know, um, I think the, the story will tell us subtly influence our psyche. If we say we lost it, then we will believe that we don't have it. What I see is that this narrative has gone sleep. And uh, so living being, like, a, you know, we are, we are human being and we wake up and sleep. Wake <coughs> up. And there's Indian myths, right? The, yeah. the, the, the god or goddess, they um, have these cycles of yeah. a wakefulness and a sleepfulness. Uh, sleep. So um, I feel like our civili civilization is in a phase of waking up from a, 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 a nightmare, a dream. And um, because you went to, you, you have experienced them both. Mm -hmm. Because you grew up in China and then went to mm -hmm. pretty diehard science in <laughs> yeah. America. Yeah. Like, was it like a, how was it for you to, to experience the other? Which one is the other you are talking about? In your, in, in your case, the other is the American one, the Western one, I think. How, how am I? I mean, I actually experienced a lot of America when I was in China. Mm. Uh, I listened to Michael, Michael Jackson, Madonna growing, growing up. There's a lot of like American influence in, in China when I was growing up. Mm. So when I was in China, actually, uh, the presence of West and Western world and America is, is a is a bigger presence in my growing up. Um, there's the there's a. Is it also overriding then the, the the feeling of the, like one Earth? Are the more Chinese people starting to think in this separate way? Yeah, so it definitely the the American way has put us away from the traditional way mm. of uh, thinking and relating. And can you explain like how a Chinese traditional view looks at the human being? Is it the same way as Vandana's? Describes it. It's the similar principle, uh, but with different, you know, of course, the language and the cultural construct. Uh, for example, um, in acupuncture system, we actually name the acupuncture point uh, as uh, ge geological features. Like there's the ocean, there's a, a mountain, uh, there's stars, and there's a song, and uh, there's rivers and abyss. So basically, if you study the Chinese medical system, you see the human body as an embodied universe. And that's, uh, okay. Mm -hmm. um, I have to uh, get stopped. Is it for you? Um, <laughs> so let's go to the next thing. Um, a theme that comes up is the health of our mm -hmm. keynote speakers. Um, one of them couldn't come, had to come to Sky, uh, had to come by, uh, in through Zoom. Uh, another one even died because he was uh, diagnosed by cancer. Um, and you, I hear more, like more stories of people who are tired and also like the enormous of the of the of the problem with climate mm -hmm. change, like mass extinction is one of the possibilities. How do we deal with this um, trouble with our health? Like, how do we say healthy, yeah. Fandana? Uh, we've just done a manifesto on food and health hmm. because so many new kinds of diseases have become of epidemic proportion. And these are called the non-communicable chronic diseases. Earlier you had TB, you had problems that you infect each other with. And now these are called lifestyle diseases, but they're not about people's choice of lifestyle. They're about the imposition of a certain way in which the planet is being contaminated with poisons and in which people's lives are being stressed out just to live. Mm. We know only 5% cancers are genetic. They're built into our system. 95% are induced either by toxics in the environment or by stress. And the toxics in the environment, I mean, so much research has been done on this, but it's kept silence because that 5% hmm. story of the genetics is constantly extrapolated so that the same pharmaceutical industry 
that through the poisons gives you cancer. Hmm. The, the same companies sell the toxics. The same companies give you cancer drugs. The same companies determine what will be understood as the causation. And causation in disease or causation in the earth is not one particle causes this disease. It is, like Ayurveda teaches us, like Taoism teaches us, it is space and time evolution. Hmm. And that causality is showing so clearly that the root causes of disease are the same fossil fuel civilization. And that's why it's wrong to only think of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, but to know that the whole system, including our bodies, are under assault. Mm. But I also mean like, because this is like a big story, but I just felt silence. And I feel it's also because I'm tired of like three days of conference. And I can imagine that you guys like travel the world and talk everywhere, that you're just tired of that this whole battle or however you will call it, it's also kind of tiring. Like, how do you deal with that? And also people at home, maybe they feel tired. Yeah, I don't ever do anything that my conscience doesn't guide me to do. Okay. And when my conscience tells me do this, then all amounts of limitless energy come and all amounts of regeneration happens. I never do anything mechanically because I did it yesterday. Mechanical repetition, including addiction to activism, can be a very depleting source. That's why people have burnout. At least five people have come up to me. How come you don't have burnout? Hmm. And? Uh, because so, yeah. even in activism, we adopt the competitive behavior, the insecurities, the running on a fast race that the dominant system has created. Hmm. So act activism becomes a total mirror of how the industrial system and, and, the, and the greed system works. So we will be sustainable activists of transformation when we become aligned, not with the industrial greed machinery and the money machine, as I've talked about in my book, Oneness in the World Percent, but we align with the earth and her energies and our consciousness. What do you think, Spring? This is the way to go. Yeah, definitely. I'm so much behind sustainable activism. I think uh, you can't, I actually think you can't actually create a sustainable world without actually embody sustainability in yourself. How do you do that? Um, a specific example, for example, for me, my body is not a machine that on top of which I run to go around to do things. My body is like a sacred temple that I attend to. So actually when I got, you know, I traveled from Seattle to Finghorn and uh, soon after I got here, I got a cold. And to me, that's like, okay, something is happening in my body. And I got to listen. For me, every physical symptom is connected to my whole system. It tells me something about what's going on in my emotional realm. It's, it's giving me information what's going on in my surrounding. It's tell, telling me something happening in relationship. So when something happened in my body, I'm like, okay, what's going on? How do I pay attention to it? How do I attune to uh, the signal that it's telling me? So, um, so yeah. You're very so in touch with your body. Yeah, because it's this is the foundation. This is like my temple that I have to, uh, through which that I have a relationship with the living planet, mm. living Earth. Yeah. But I know so many people, and actually myself, well, uh -huh. I get better and better in it. <laughs> who is who is not in touch with their body? Mm. So how can you start to learn it? Um, gosh, there like there's so many resources. Like mm. uh, for example, the uh, Stephanie Mind they, they teach, so. Just by these simple methods, for example, Qigong exercise. And for me, like, for example, every morning I gave myself a stretch of time, do whatever Qigong, Tai Chi, yoga, to turn your inward attention inward to attend to your body and pay attention to what you're sensing, not just your thinking, um, is a starting point. To me, that's like attending the soil of the yeah. earth, mm -hmm. is you attending the soil. Back at the soil again. Yeah. <laughs> Charles, how do you do that with your health? Do you recognize the theme? Mm -hmm. One thing is when I'm pushing myself beyond the limits of my body and I'm starting to get sick and break down, I ask myself, what is actually motivating this push? Is it that this is it truly in best service or is it to assuage a feeling of not enoughness or a feeling of guilt or a feeling of, of responsibility that 
that I'm not doing enough and I'm only a good person. I only get to like myself and love myself and approve of myself if I'm giving more than I, I take. If that is the motive, if the motive is to demonstrate my virtue, what I will achieve in the world is nothing more than the demonstration of my virtue. What I will not achieve is actually helping this planet. So the body, I think, like, like Spring was saying, communicates these conflicting motives uh, in physical form. So I can, so if I'm having a, a physical breakdown of some sort, I'm not saying that it's definitely because of, you know, this some kind of psycho-spiritual condition, but it's something I ask myself. Hmm. You see it as a symptom, of, maybe as a warning sign. Like your, it's a message. A message. Yeah. And, and I don't necessarily, I'm not necessarily able to decipher that message every time. But it can be a very, it doesn't even have to be an intellectual understanding of what the message is. It could just be, okay, I better rest right now. Coming back, like it's a call to return to self-trust. And if I'm being told to rest, then rest. This peacemaking with the self is part of a larger template of peacemaking with nature because we're a part of nature and and the the field of peace and the end of the war against the self that's a generator of a field of peace with nature and the end of the war on nature would this be like a one of the solutions for climate change making peace with ourselves Yeah, and it's part of the same mindset, you know, because we can do the same with the earth and we can we can look at how how the earth and the forest and the rivers are suffering and learn to recognize that. And that is, again, it's a it's a message. And we may not like Bondon was saying, we may not know exactly what the cause is. In fact, mm. the the urge to identify a singular cause is a relic of a Newtonian force-based um, system of causality. But we can enter into the into the questioning. Hmm. Vandana, you're nodding. Yeah, I'm nodding because uh, <clears throat> I think the climate debate needs to move to taking care of the Earth, mm-hmm. giving the Earth rest. Everything will get solved when we turn to that, rather than using all the old mindset of conquest, to think of how can we fix the earth, out of which comes geoengineering, which is further devastating the planet. Genetic engineering already destroyed large numbers of species, and in my country, 300,000 farmers have been forced to commit suicide. So we actually have sacred sites in India mm-hmm. where the big festival is the one week of rest for the earth, mm-hmm. because she's living. They literally have a, a picnic, a holiday, but nobody plows. No work is done in the field. Our bodies need rest. Our minds need rest from this hectic slavery that everyone's brains are performing. Yeah. And the earth needs rest. Because through the rest, her power to regenerate, through the rest, our body's power to regenerate, is able to find the space. That's why the living earth And us as living beings on this living earth is the only solution to all the multiple crises we face. Okay. On that note of peace and rest, let's close this edition of the Daily Conference update. I thank my guest. Thank you for participating. And uh, I hope you will uh, watch tomorrow again at 5.30 here again on Facebook Live. And uh, we will have another day tomorrow where we talk again about the topics about climate change and consciousness. Thank you for watching. Bye.